All right. I think we can go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you, everyone, again for joining. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Jason, can you hear me? Just making I sure. I can. Yes. Yes, I can. Very good. Very good. Well, thank you, everyone, again for joining the Compliance Corner Monthly Meeting. Uh, my name is Blaise Wabo. We're waiting for a few minutes there for everybody to join. Uh, this particular month, we're going to be talking about quality. So for most of you that know, we have been doing for the last four years uh, what we call a compliance uh, benchmark survey. And this particular year, we've interviewed or we got a survey from seven, 700 compliance professionals. And we had four key themes. Our four key themes are quality, efficiency, culture of security, and partnership. So last month on our very first Compliance Corner Monthly, we talked about the four, we highlighted the four key themes. And then for the next four months, starting this month, we're going to go in deeper dive for each of their key uh, results areas. And this month, we're going to discuss quality. So I'm going to introduce myself quickly, then I'm going to turn it over to Jason to introduce himself as well. So again, my name is Blaise Wabo. I live in beautiful Denver, Colorado. I've been with a line for uh, 10 years. Over 10 years, actually, 11 years. I uh, started as an auditor, uh, led a team of auditors as well. In the last two years, I'm a subject matter expert specifically for the healthcare and financial services practices. Uh, and before I line, I worked for KPMG doing SOX for, for testing. Excited for the conversation on quality. And Jason, I'll turn it over to you for your introduction. All right. Uh, great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, excited to be here. And uh, thanks, Blaze, for having me. Um, my name is Jason Wheeler. I'm the Vice President of Cyber and Network Security with HealthBridge. Uh, my background is in audit, compliance, and cybersecurity. I uh, started my career with Deloitte in their advisory practice. Um, there, I really developed my skills in audit, consulting, and risk management, and uh, primarily with clients in the financial services industry. Uh, prior to coming to HealthBridge, I worked at a Denver-based firm called Cooper Richards, which was an audit and advisory firm. And there I worked, uh, helped clients with a lot of SOX audits, um, SOC 2, uh, their internal audit functions, um, and also some technical audits like sec SAP security audits. Um, so, yeah, and uh, also I am based in Denver as well. Oh. Very good. Thank you, Jason. So from Jason's background, I, and I think you're the perfect fit for this particular webinar, Jason, when, we, when it comes to uh, quality as it relates to compliance assessments, uh, because you have their background both as an auditor yourself, right, uh, with Deloitte and uh, the local mm -hmm. firm in Denver, and as a client that reviewed the report of auditors, right, uh, like you are now with Healthbridge and you, with your previous experience as well with Wells Fargo. So I think you have the perfect experience in both worlds to kind of provide your perspective on what quality actually means, right? So when we take a step back and we talk about security compliance assessments, when you think about the context of uh, uh, quality, what does that actually mean to you, Jason? How would you define what a quality report means? Yeah, uh, for security assessments such as a pen test or a HIPAA risk assessment, um, no quality for me in a report um, will really, uh, it'll be in-depth and comprehensive. So it'll go beyond just uh, checking the box to see that we have minimal uh, compliance uh, with, uh, with standards. Um, but it also dig deeper into our systems. They do a deep dive into our systems, looking at uh, the in-scope processes and controls and applications and really provide a comprehensive overview of our um, security posture in that report, um, identifying vulnerabilities, uh, strengths, weakness, weaknesses, and areas um, for improvement. Um, and then additionally, um, the report, the assessment, look for it to be clearly written, um, so easily understood and consumable by people who are both technical and non-technical, um, so not a lot of technical jargon. Um, again, comprehensive, um, so it's covering the scope of, of what we determine in the planning and, and scoping phase. Uh, it's covering those things in depth. Uh, so not a checklist, uh, like I said, a checklist that you're, you have the minimum compliance requirement filled here and, and move on, but really going deeper into that, um, into the effectiveness of, of, of uh, our program. Uh, also, uh, evidence-based. Um, I think uh, assessments that are not evidence-based really are, not, uh, are unreliable. Um, so uh, if there's 
uh, vulnerability findings, um, weaknesses, uh, exceptions. Uh, I want that supported by evidence so I can take that back to our team and we can evaluate it and, and take the appropriate actions to, to remediate uh, whatever the finding was. Um, and additionally, um, actionable recommendations. So uh, good auditors are typically going to be very in tune with best practices and industry standards, in our case, HIPAA requirements and things like that. So um, they usually stay ahead ahead of uh, and up to date on those things. So their recommendations clearly written uh, and allowing us to proactively identify and address risk and also prepare for changes in um, emerging uh, security risk as well as uh, any regulatory compliance changes. <laughs> Very good, Jason. Um, I, I love your definition. You know, you talked about a lot of different components. You talked about the scope needs to be appropriate. You talked about the fact that the auditors need to have the appropriate experience in the industry in which you guys are. You also talked about the fact that uh, the quality of the testing needs to be uh, evidence-based, right? The auditor needs to look at the evidence um, and test the evidence and provide a, uh, a an opinion essentially on whether uh, the control was met by the evidence provided or not. And I think our respondents actually agree with that, right? As we look at the, the statistics on this particular screen, 31% of our, of our respondents say uh, they want quality for them means they need to work with a trusted auditor with a positive market perception, right? And then 21% uh, wants the report to come from uh, a firm that has done leadership, right? Um, um, and then the last thing you mentioned there as well was the fact that uh, a quality report needs to have recommendations, right? It needs to be recommendations from the auditor on what what are some things within your control environment that you can improve, that can you can you can do to improve your security posture overall, right? And when we look at this particular quote on the screen, and this quote comes from one of our clients, uh, Mark Petrie uh, from Goodlib. Uh, the quote says, one of the things that I think a lot about is what the audit assessment means in terms of representing the security posture of the company. If we have a good SOC 2 report, it means a lot of the harder questions doesn't get asked. And essentially what Mark was saying there is, if you have a report, uh, not necessarily with an exception, even sometimes you can have exceptions, but recommendations on what could be done to improve the security posture, if those are not documented within your report, that means you probably did not have the auditor asks hard questions. Jason, what are your thoughts on that particular course? Do you agree or do you disagree? Yeah, um, I, I totally agree with uh, Mark's quote and his perspective there. Um, and especially with the SOC 2 uh, assurance report, um, it, it, those those are very rigorous audits um, that have to be in, uh, uh, performed uh, under AICP standards, which are very stringent. Um, so I think when someone sees an audit, uh, SOC 2 report, and a good SOC 2 report um, for an organization, um, automatically that has credibility and, and they're going to know that that organization has comprehensive uh, security controls in place, uh, operational controls, uh, business controls in place. So it really um, uh, is a report that holds a lot of weight and, um, and, um, and also it will uh, um, definitely answer a lot of the hard questions up front because the auditors with those AICP standards, they will already ask those challenging questions. So I think definitely uh, you'd have a lot less questions from others with something like that. Absolutely. No, like you said, the AICPA, which stands by the way for the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, uh, for those in the audience, um, they have a very thorough methodology, right? They are the, uh, the organization that sets the standards for financial statement audits as well uh, as it relates to uh, public organizations. So from a from an attestation standpoint for SAC 2 engagement, uh, the level of rigorousness of the testing for the auditors is pretty stringent as well. Uh, so to your point, and which Mark agrees as well here in this particular quote, uh, the auditors should make sure that they are reviewing the risk in the environment of the uh, the, con the control environment that you're auditing, they should understand the risk of that particular industry and look, provide recommendations on what the company can do to improve their security posture, right? So I, I think we we agree there. Um, as a follow-up to that, 
Jason, maybe when you look at the context of your industry, right, HealthBridge, you guys mm -hmm. are a both a healthcare uh, organization that leverages technology to provide financial services to mm -hmm. your customers in healthcare. Uh, so you're you're in healthcare, you're in financial services, you're in fintech. Uh, how does having a quality audit report show demonstrate a well-rounded view of the state of your security program? Uh, how what does that mean for you guys in your industry? Yeah, so um, you know I think a, a quality audit and a quality audit uh, report. Um, I think one of the big pluses to that is the independence and the objectivity a quality auditor is going to bring. And they're going to come with fresh viewpoints um, and may be able to uh, identify vulnerabilities and inefficiencies that we may not, um, or we may have overlooked. Um, so having that fresh set of eyes uh, come in uh, with objectivity uh, is key. And also uh, through the audit report and, and sound audit procedures, um, they will be able to kind of validate that we have a, a well-rounded um, uh, security program. So um, again, uh, what I would look for is uh, a comprehensive audit uh, that's clearly written. Uh, again, uh, auditors typically uh, incorporate industry, and in our case, HIPAA um, best practices. Um, they'll be able to provide recommendations and suggestions on on uh, emerg emerging security risk as well as uh, emerging compliance and regulatory uh, changes that may be coming. Um, but I think uh, the comprehens comprehensiveness of the report um, that they do the in-depth uh, audit procedures that really helps us uh, evidence to others uh, that we do have a well-rounded, uh, continuously improving, uh, proactive uh, security posture and approach. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. No, I, I think that's that's spot on. And uh, the respondents within our uh, survey actually demonstrated that as well. Uh, one of the key things that uh, we, we found within the survey is uh, correspondents are saying compliance reports are a vital means of demonstrating the state of an organization's compliance program to stakeholders, right? So it's important to do it right and show uh, trustworthiness. So essentially, when, we, when you think about Regulators, customers, clients, stakeholders, investors, they want to make sure that the data that your organization has and the data that you collect, you're, you're keeping that data secure. You have done best practice controls and due diligence to ensure that you are securing that data, correct? And uh, as you are doing business with that organization, you're building trust because they can trust that they are sharing the data with you and you're keeping that data integral. And when it comes to an auditor, um, um, you know, in the audit practice, we the work that we do is called assurance. We have to provide reasonable assurance to the stakeholders of our clients, in this case, HealthBridge, that we have done our due diligence. We did not just do copying and pasting. We did not just do, um, you know, brace through the audits and, you know, just to be completed with without doing our due diligence by doing all the required testing. Uh, so essentially what customers are buying or what the uh, stakeholders are looking for is trust, right? And majority of our respondents say that 69% deemed a high quality audit report is extremely important, right? Uh, 69%. And um, maybe a question there, Jason, would be, Having worked with different auditors in the past, right, which you experienced both as an auditor yourself and also, uh, you know, in the industry uh, where you are now, you know, when you compare the different auditors you've worked with, have you experienced the difference in the quality when reading an audit report? And can you provide some few examples? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So um, uh, you're absolutely right. I've seen both uh, high quality reports and some that that are less quality or deficient. Um um, I think deficient auto reports are pretty easily easy to spot. Um, they typically lack depth and 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 um, detail into what was um, what was evaluated, what was analyzed, and for findings uh, not well documented. Uh, maybe light on their um, when you have conversations with them. Maybe light on the evidence and the test procedures that they performed. Um, and additionally. Um, Usually the, the recommendations, if there are any, um, are very high level and, and vague. Um, 
So uh, to give you an example of uh, kind of a deficient auto report as a high level example. So, um, and this wasn't at Health, Healthbridge, but um, at, at in a, a, a past role that I had, um, we got an auto report and the finding was um, your vulnerability management program is uh, insufficient or de de uh, deficient, something similar to that type of high level broad language. And you really can't do much with that. Um, it's not telling you uh, specific, uh, specifics as to what in the program uh, is deficient. So it's really difficult to glean any value from that and to improve your security program. And I think something like that, when you have a deficient audit reports, uh, that kind of evidence is that you could have ongoing vulnerabilities and weaknesses um, that that auditor is not identifying. So that's a huge risk for us. Um, and uh, on the flip side, a quality audit report, again, it's going to be comp comprehensive. It's going to be detailed analysis. Uh, findings are going to be supported by evidence. Um, the audit procedures that they perform are, are going to be clear when you have those conversations. And taking that uh, example of a vulnerability management program, uh, in a quality audit report, they would have said, well, there's some deficiencies in your vulnerability management program. But they would have gone to a deeper level and said, well, your scans may not be deep enough or they're not uh, the scope of the scans are not uh, covering all the critical assets that you should be covering. Uh, your remediation and review of those vulnerabilities uh, is, are not timely. So it's going to give you some recommendations, some real detail on what the problem is. And then you can go back to your team, see if it's a control gap, a design issue, um, or something else going on, or a one-off. So really um, stark difference. And like I said, very easy to see the difference between high quality and a deficient. No, Jason, thank you for providing that example. And I think, you know, most of the attendees in the audience can probably relate, right? And being an auditor myself, like I mentioned, for, for 14 years, um, I can quickly tell, right, with uh, the length of the report, right, or the details of the testing. And by the way, the length of the report most of the time will translate to detail of the testing, right, with, even though it's not always the case. But when you think about an auditor's test, with the example that you use with vulnerability management, right, one organization or one auditor can just say they review the policy and the procedures to determine right. if the vulnerability management uh, program was in place. But we both know that's not sufficient. The policy only tells you what the organization should do. The procedures tells you how to do it, right? And who performs that function. But then it doesn't stop there. Uh, the auditor needs to make sure that they're performing inquiry testing to corroborate uh, the understanding of the subject matter experts that are doing that particular, um, um, implementing that particular control that they are understanding what the policy says, they are following the procedures as the procedure uh, document describes, but also uh, they need to provide, the auditor needs to provide or review uh, tangible evidence that describes, for example, when was the last vulnerability management test performed, right? Um, um, was that documented? Uh, was it documented in a particular portal? Was it documented in an Excel documentation? Was there a meeting performed? within minutes or the notes of the meeting that details, you know, a scenario that was went through from start to end on how the, the program has actually been managed, right? So from an auditor's perspective, as it relates to quality, I think it's important that the auditor just goes beyond reviewing the policy and procedure document, but that they are also substantiating that testing with interview tests to corroborate the understanding of the individuals within that particular role. And then they are, they are reviewing tangible evidence, right? Whether it's a report, whether it's a ticket, whether there are minutes from a particular meeting that were held during that time frame, or a screenshot from a system that shows documentation of the actual um, uh, vulnerability management meeting happening or the test being performed and those sort of things. And you know, I think our respondents actually, as part of the survey, I agree with that particular um, comment uh, because 22% of our respondents um, um, of all companies that were surveyed said that the top reason for choosing an auditor was the report quality uh, with an even higher percentage uh, for when it comes to the IT service industry, right? An exhaustive and high quality report is essential, is essential for these companies because of the reputation and the financial risk associated with a cyber attack. 
And Jason, I think you would agree that the threat landscape in which we are today is continuously increasing, right? Uh, the number of uh, ransomware attacks, the number of cyber incidents, and the number of um, cyber breaches, especially in the healthcare and financial services, continuously is continuously increasing. So now organizations are being held accountable, right? Especially if you're a public company, the SSC passed a, a, a cyber incident notification rule uh, last year where every public company is required to notify uh, after they are aware of a breach in the environment within three to four days, right? You have to notify um, um, required parties. So there are more and more regulations. The light has been shone to ensure that companies have best practices in place to ensure that they're managing your program. And just having a great uh, audit partner to ensure that the quality of your report um, um, uh, goes a long way with that, right? Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And um, and as you'd mentioned, um, you know, in the healthcare industry, uh, because organizations handle so much PHI and PII, um, mm -hmm. it, it, healthcare organizations are definitely high targets for cyber attacks. Um, so having a quality audit partner, kind of as I alluded to earlier, they're going to have um, the industry insights, the resources, the research. Um, to really help advise you, not just in the audit, but also provide recommendations about um, emerging uh, emerging uh, security uh, risk, emerging security threats. Uh, they'll be able to give you some recommendations on how you can be proactive in addressing uh, potential um, compliance changes that might be coming down. You mentioned the new S, uh, the new SEC uh, cyber uh, security requirement. Um, so you're gonna have that expertise uh, with a quality audit firm that will really be able to help guide you. And like I said, not just in the audit report, but also being proactive so you can kind of continuously improve and kind of anticipate some of the risk in the future um, or uh, uh, emerging risk. And uh, a, a good audit report or uh, audit partner can really help you uh, address those things. Absolutely. Absolutely. And let's focus for the healthcare industry for a minute, right? When you mm -hmm. think about the evolving landscape, you know, pre-COVID, post-COVID, uh, before COVID, telemedicine wasn't a big thing, right? Wasn't such a thing. Uh, but during COVID, we see a, uh, a big increase in the adoption of telemedicine as a technology, um, and which I think makes sense, right? Especially for people that live in rural areas that don't have easy access to healthcare. Uh, telemedicine mm. certainly helps in that area. Mm. But then with telemedicine and even with professionals, healthcare professionals working remotely, now we have, you know, potentially patient information that is going back and forth between people go working from their homes. Uh, you know, if you're doing a telemedicine session, maybe your medical professional is taking that call from his home or her home office, uh, which is not in the traditional brick and mortar hospital facility with, with a higher network, right? Or that individual could be traveling and they are maybe using unsecured Wi-Fi in a coffee shop or a, a hotel or an airport, right? And then earlier this year, I, I believe it was March, uh, I think in the United States, we've seen the biggest um, um, cyber breach for a healthcare organization, Change Healthcare, right? Which is a subsidiary of United Health Group. Uh, they had a ransomware attack, right? And um, with that, regulators are certainly shining the light on healthcare for sure. But in, in your own vanity point, Jason, when you think about um, quality um, uh, for compliance assessment, why is quality compliance so important in your industry, especially healthcare? Yeah, uh, yeah. So it's it's, it's critically important um, to have a quality compliance program in place, and 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 a, as well as a uh, a partner, uh, audit partner to help you um, achieve uh, a, a, a strong quality uh, compliance uh, stance. But I think for health organizations in particular, kind of what I alluded to earlier is um, very high targets for cyber uh, attacks. So um, uh, because of the amount of large volume of PHI and PII that healthcare organizations uh, typically have, um, it's definitely a rich target. Um, for cyber attacks. Now, the quality compliance program, um, it's going to help us um, identify vulnerabilities because audits obviously are part of that 
compliance, uh, quality compliance program. Um, but it's going to help us, again, proactively identify risk, vulnerabilities, weaknesses, areas for improvement, um, in addition to helping us, helping us maintain the requirements for like HIPAA, in our case, HIPAA, uh, the HIPAA privacy rule, as well as high trust. Um, so I think, um, you know, just the quality compliance and governance um, uh, is really key to ensure that we are continuously looking at our security postures, uh, continuously doing things to identify and mitigate uh, relevant risk. And also uh, the quality compliance program really helps a lot with our credibility and our trust with our stakeholders, uh, patients, investors, uh, shareholders. Um, so it really is a, a, a key component, I believe, at any organization and to grow the business. Thank you, Jason. I couldn't agree with you, with you more. Again, we come back to that word trust, right? Uh, building that trust with your stakeholders, uh, with your clients uh, in the healthcare space, essentially with the patient, right? And uh, healthcare is very critical because in most cases, it could be a matter of life or death, right? Uh, imagine you have a patient on an operating bed and uh, the system of the hospital is encrypted and they cannot access the system. Now you might provide medication to someone that's allergic to something. Right, that might trigger them to go into into a shock or cardiac arrest or something like that. Uh, so, for healthcare, is critically important. Obviously, HIPAA, um, um, the Health Information Portable uh, Portability and Accountability Act, is a law in the United States that was passed in 1996 by President Bill Clinton. And with a law, if you violate a law, there are consequences, right? Uh, so, I I think we're also seeing the Health and Human um, Services (HHS.gov) uh, trying to be more proactive, right? Especially after the change healthcare breach uh, that happened in March of this year, 2024. They are trying to be more proactive. Uh, they are working with the Department of Justice uh, that is enforcing fines, you know, their criminal fines, their civil fines for any organization that doesn't do their due diligence, right? To uh, ensure that they are building that trust with the patient as well. So Jason, thank you. Um, one other thing I think it's important for us to uncover as part of you know, uh, what we're talking about today is the top three reasons that we've seen our respondents provide as well uh, is uh, the experience of the auditor. Like you mentioned, you know, you need to work with an audit team uh, in your case that has experience with both healthcare and financial services, right? Because um, every audit needs to be done from a perspective of risk management, right? The If the auditor cannot understand the risk that they're trying to mitigate, then they don't know where to focus their test on. And, you know, I remember back in uh, 2015 when I first became a, a manager and I had a, a team I was working with, I would typically tell my team, you cannot audit what you do not understand, right? Uh, or, or else you're just basically checking the box, right? Um, essentially. Uh, and a check the box activity or check the box audit doesn't basically help the organization mitigate the risk or get a quality report that they are hoping to be able to get. Right. Um, um, so working with an audit or, or a company, an auditor or a company that understands the industry in which you are, they understand the technology stack in which you're uh, it, with which you work. Um, um, obviously, they deliver a quality report, which which also goes like you talked about before, uh, the evidence base where they're actually testing evidence and those sort of things. One of the things I want to highlight on this particular screen, uh, number three here is uh our top three, uh, the top three reasons, uh, nineteen percent of our respondents said they want to work with an audit company that has tech a tech enabled um, efficiency, right, or a tech enabled audit, right. So that talks about the efficiency part. Now I know efficiency was one of the four core areas for our respondents, which we're going to talk about that next month. But just <clears throat> a vanity point when when it comes to efficiency, right, or using technology to facilitate your audits, which I think translates into quality as well. How important do you think is to use some sort of GRC portal or some sort of uh, technology to facilitate the audit so that um, the process goes efficiently and also the quality of the report has been delivered there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, very important. And I'm sure uh, a lot of people on the call can relate that Audits and assessments, um, they can be very time consuming, uh, collecting evidence, um, meeting with auditors, um, um, 
preparing documentation, uh, having status meetings. Um, so the, to, to where, you, where you can drive any efficiencies, which uh, when you can drive efficiencies with uh, a, a repository, GRC tool, uh, file sharing tools, um, automated uh, testing tools, automated audit testing tools, all of those things really can make a big impact um, to uh, make the audit more efficient. Um, and it also frees up uh, at least my team and myself potentially to do other things um, instead of doing a lot of things, say, manually. Um, and additionally, for the status, uh, when there's a, a nice repository where evidence is uh, a request and evidence is posted and you can get status updates, um, in some cases, 24-7, um, that is very helpful. Uh, it helps the audit, um, our scheduling to be flexible um, and as well as, uh, you know, freeing up some of our time with those audit, uh, automated tools as well as uh, um, uh, repositories. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think here it's also important to highlight artificial intelligence, right? I think that's the buzzword in most conversations these days. Mm -hmm. And I, I think... One thing that we're seeing more and more is a lot of GRC tools from a tech standpoint as it relates to audits are building a lot of automation, right? Where you can automate some of your control monitoring. Um, and mm -hmm. from an auditor standpoint, you can um, be able to review, you know, we've always used the idea of sample-based testing, which, you know, still exists and it will probably still exist. But now with a lot of GRC tool and automation, you can review the whole population of, of incidents, right? Instead of yeah. just selecting 25 incidents uh, mm -hmm. within a, a list of incidents that happen in a particular year for a customer, you can review all the tickets, right? And be able to have a more accurate judgment on how mature the control of that organization is, right? And all that again leads to quality because as you leverage technology, especially artificial intelligence, you can do more targeted testing as an auditor that produces more accurate results Obviously, we don't, we don't, we will never get to the point as auditors where we provide absolute, absolute assurance. We still provide reasonable assurance, but the more you can leverage technology to help you get accurate results and also recommendations, like you mentioned, Jason, right? Because you can test a sample of 25, but you have more exposure in some other areas that you didn't sample. But with mm -hmm. AI, you can do more targeted testing of a greater population and provide more recommendations to that company on what they can do to improve their security posture holistically, right? Yeah, absolutely. And um, and like and uh, you know, AI, um, like you said, that's definitely going to be a game changer. And that's one thing that comes to mind uh, to me, having been a, a, an auditor in the past, is that you know. Because I, a lot of times when I was on engagements, I'd say, well, we're looking at 25 and there's, you know, th the population is thousands, right? So it's hard to really, really glean, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, a good view into what the risk or if there's a vulnerability there or an exception. So AI definitely is going to be in the uh, machine learning, definitely a game changer. You're going to be able to uh, have much more effective, much faster audits, uh, much more effective in that you will be able to basically test an entire population. Um, they'll be able to extrapolate different uh, things out of that population in that testing. So again, it, uh, it does feed into uh, better results, uh, better recommendations. Uh, and again, uh, tying in that over to uh, security, that's going to uh, provide us with better um, um, insight into what controls we should have in place um, and what risks that we should, uh, manage more, uh, intensely. Very good. Very good. Thank you, Jason. So, um, I, I think the next segment here for, our, for our, our conversation would be red flags, right? When you look at an audit report, what are some audit red flags that you should pay attention to? Um, and some of the things that we've seen from the respondents of our report, um, are along the lines of, um, some things that you should pay attention to when it comes to an audit report is um, the perfect report with no exception, right? We talked about this earlier. Mm -hmm. we, we talked about a quote from Mark, uh, one of our clients from Goodlib. Uh, but if you look at while the clean report without exception might seem ideal, it could indicate that your auditor isn't 
uh, thorough enough, right? In a SAT2 report, for example, or even in high trust, for example, mm -hmm. unqualified opinion can still have exceptions. These exceptions highlight areas for security improvement. Uh, if you receive an unqualified opinion with no exception, take a, a, a moment to check back uh, the red flags before accepting the results, right? So we talked about our recommendations there. But specifically, as you guys just completed this, the high trust, um, Jason, you know very well that in high trust, it's almost impossible to score 100% for every single uh, control, right? They, they, mm -hmm. they, they typically leverage the mentality of, um, improving your security posture, so continuous monitoring, just like ISO. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I think that's one red flag that uh, uh, people should be aware of, uh, not getting a perfect report without exceptions, because that that usually doesn't happen. Uh, also, another thing that our respondents have said is that the vagueness of the report. If the report lacks the specific references of the organization's security environment and seems very generic, that means that the auditor maybe did some copying and pasting. They were they were rushing to produce a report. Uh, they were doing some. Uh, they were using a cookie cutter approach on how they are gathering um, the the verbiage within that report. So those are things that our, our, our respondents are also saying that they've noticed, and and I think we agree on as well. Um, the length of the report. Uh, this is one aspect that when I saw the the, the results, I I uh, I laughed on, but. You know, I think it transcribes, it translates to the, the the level of testing that the auditor did. And as they're documenting their testing, obviously that report will become more comprehensive, right? And, and more uh, more volume to it as well. So uh, that's also one thing that we, we saw there. Uh, and an, an incorporated auditor, right? So there's some auditors that unfortunately, like we talked about, uh, Jason, and this drives me nuts, right? I, like I mentioned earlier, when I first became a manager in 2015, I would tell my, uh, the team I work with, you cannot audit what you do not understand. Unfortunately, there are some auditors that do not understand the client's environment. They don't understand their technology stack. They don't understand the deployment methodology. They don't understand cloud security. They don't understand the industry in which you are. So now they are following something like high trust requirements or SAC2 criteria or what, whatever framework you're using, right? And they're trying to read the letter of the control without understanding the intents of the control. Neither do they understand the risk they're trying to mitigate from the customer's perspective. And they are trying to fight back with the auditor or with the client. If the client says, in our environment, laptops are not in scope. The auditor say, well, the requirement says how to test laptops. What do you mean laptops are not in scope? Now they are trying to make you fail a control or make you test the control that's not applicable. So from your standpoint, maybe let's uncover that part a little bit, Jason. When it comes to an auditor that's combating a client on something that is maybe not applicable because the auditor doesn't understand the scope of the audit or the risk they're trying to mitigate, how have you experienced that before? And how would you handle that if you're dealing with a combative auditor? So um, I haven't really had a combative auditor, but I have had auditors where it was difficult to get answers to um, substantive questions, may ab maybe about, um, can you kind of walk me through your, um, your test plan? Um, you know, how are you arriving to some of these conclusions? And, and uh, a red flag for me, which is in line with this, is that uncooperative um, in the sense that they are evasive. Um, they they not answering direct questions about, hey, can you walk me through this? Can you show me the evidence? Uh, can you tell me what test procedures that you uh, perform to arrive at this conclusion? And these red flags, um, just to add an additional point on this, I mean, I, I think they can be very serious having a deficient audit report with these types of red flags, because if, if people are relying on that report, um, you could have um, unidentified vulnerabilities and risks that you're not aware of that an audit, a good quality audit would have caught. So, you know, that in the short run and the long run can open you to compliance violations if you were in, uh, uh, were to have to be subject to a regulatory audit and they come in and they find a bunch of stuff that you're like, oh, well, we have this clean audit report, um, but it wasn't going deep enough. Um, you're opening yourself to maybe un, um, unidentified risk uh, in security posture. Um, so maybe you, you're at a higher risk of a data breach. So, you know, uh, an audit, uh, insufficient, deficient audit report and auditor 
uh, is got huge risk for the organization. Absolutely. No, thanks for sharing your experience, Jason. I think that's very important. Um, you know, getting a clean report from an auditor, but then regulator and re regulators right. come later and, uh, you know, they're finding things that the auditor should have pointed out that it did not point out. So, you know, very, very relevant there. Um, one statistics from our survey uh, from this 2024 compliance benchmark survey uh, report, which, by the way, if you haven't downloaded it yet, uh, there will be a link at the end of this particular slide uh, or particular webinar where you can go on our website and, and download the, the full report. But 33% uh, or one out of three organizations uh, have had a report rejected uh, by their vendor or prospect leading to additional time and money being spent uh, to produce an acceptable report, right? Which means that you could have lost revenue, you could have lost a, you know, a particular customer during that time. 38%, uh, guys, that's one out of three um, uh, organizations during our, uh, our, our survey said that they've had a report rejected. Jason, have you ever had that happen to you or have you had a peer in the industry whose report has been rejected before? Um, so I haven't had a, a vendor report um, rejected, um, but um, to add on to that point, I mean, third-party risk management um, is huge now. So I think vendors um, and other stakeholders are being much more um, uh, focused on these independent audit reports and what's in them and the quality um, to see that they can rely on them because um, they're exposing their org organization potentially to some additional risk. So um, I think a, a, a substandard audit report um, scenarios like this could happen where it's rejected by a vendor. Um, you, in that case, you may, like you said, you may have lost revenues, um, lost opportunities. Um, and also you may have to switch, well, likely you would have to switch auditors. And there's a transition period to switch an additional cost to switch auditors. Um, so, you know, it's really a strategic decision to make sure you have the right audit partner up front um, so you don't run into these types of things. And I actually, when I saw that one out of three, I was really, really blown away by that statistic. I just sat high. No, well, thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jason. It happens. It happens. And uh, to, to your point, switching auditor in the middle of an audit is not, it's not easy. Uh, it's very costly uh, to have to redo work and those sort of things as well. And as we wrap up the presentation here, um, you know, we'll try to wrap it up in five minutes, then leave 10 minutes for questions here at the end. But let's talk about what are some qualities of a reputable auditor, right? So essentially, what are some things to do as you choose a quality audit partner? Um, I think it's very important. Um, the, the, our survey re, uh, uh, results, uh, the report found out that companies value high quality reports, but 14% uh, say budget constraints are the greatest challenge to the audit process, right? So 14% of our MM respondents said, uh, they had budget constraints. That's why they had to go maybe with a, you know, a cheaper auditor with less quality versus, you know, somebody else. So they were, were trying to weigh the cost of um, quality versus the cost of the report, right? Uh, further, some of the other uh, statistics that we have from the from the respondents from from the particular survey shows that a vast majority, about eighty three percent, reported that they had to fill out security questionnaires. And almost half, so 47% of that 83% said that they had to fill out at least 11 of security questionnaires throughout the whole year because, uh, like you mentioned, Jason, the third-party auditor did not accept uh, the, the quality of the report. So they had to fill in addition to go to an audit, which audit fatigue is a, is a real thing, as we know, and the audience here, most of you guys know. Then now you have to fill additional questionnaires about... 47% of the 83 that fill out security questionnaires said they had to fill about eight of those, I'm sorry, about 11 security questionnaires per year. Jason, from your vanity point, when it comes to selecting an audit partner, mm -hmm. uh, what are some things that you look for and why is it important? And what are some what, what are some benefits of selecting a good partner to avoid those things that we talked about? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so like I mentioned, you know, selecting a quality, uh, reliable, um, dependable 
audit partner is really a strategic decision because um, the audit reports, their procedures, um, the the assessments, I mean, they can have organizational wide impacts. Um, they could, and like I said, with vendors, you could be uh, looking at lost business. You can open yourself up to data breaches, uh, compliance violations, uh, reputational damage. Um, so it's a really, really important decision. And it's it's challenging because, again, audit compliance, it can be very expensive, not just financially, but in also resources um, for teams. So that is always uh, definitely a concern to try and balance that, the expense with the value. Um, but some of the things that I look for, um, really, I look for the reputation um, just in, in the industry and in the audit and assurance uh, industry. Um, and you can get a lot of that online. Um, definitely want to make sure the, uh, the audit firm has uh, applicable um, experience and expertise in healthcare industry. Uh, with things that we're concerned with, uh, the HIPAA privacy rule, high trust, SOC 2. Um, and I also look for firms that have both an advisory as well as an audit practice, uh, because there will be times where you need to do, for example, with the HIPAA uh, high trust, we had to do the readiness assessment and then the, um, the validated uh, high trust assessment. But we were able to do that uh, with, with A-Line. Uh, and they have to have their independence. So they have to be two separate teams. So that kind of one-stop shop is very uh, important to have that in-house. Um, a uh, audit partner that values communication. Um, so I would probably talk to some of the audit partners, maybe senior managers, managers, kind of see what their perspective is. How well do they keep the client informed? Um, you know, how easy, accessible are they? And then uh, additionally, as we mentioned, their use of uh, automated tools and technology to help drive some efficiencies in the audit process. And then finally, which I think is a big thing, is to uh, talk to existing or former clients um, and see what their experience was to get that firsthand feedback. And I think that's probably one of the most important things to do. Okay. Absolutely. No, Jason, I, I agree, and I think our respondents agree as well. The experience of the of the audit uh, firm, uh, not only with the technology stack, uh, uh, the cloud for sure, because everybody's in the cloud today. Your industry as well, uh, but I like the fact that you pointed out that uh, it's very important to get references. Right, uh, talk to the customers uh, that have gone to the audits. Uh, with the current vendor that you're interviewing, right? And make sure that you have a process of selection uh, to ensure that uh, you select the right partner for for your organization. Mm -hmm. um, with that being said, uh, I think we can start looking at some questions here. Okay. So Jason, I'm, I may start sending some of this your way. I, I'm going to read them as well. Um, so uh, I think DVR says, hi, Jason. Uh, how how do you make sure to ensure the quality of the content and description of the controls? Uh, let me read more uh, in the actual audit report. So how can you tell uh, uh, the quality of the of the report by the description of the content of the controls? Um, so are you referring to maybe a SOC two report or? Um, I, I think possibly, probably from the context of the SOC two, yeah. Um, and I'm sorry, could you repeat that again? So just, I want to make sure I understand. Yeah, sure. So the individual is asking, how do you ensure that the report is quality, essentially, uh, mm -hmm. based on the content and the description of the controls in the audit report? Yeah. So, um, again, reading through it, um, I would probably, uh, to get that assurance um, that you're referring to, um, not only reading the report, but I'd probably have conversations with the auditor uh, themselves and get an understand, uh, understanding of um, how they tested their, the controls, um, what uh, methodologies that they used. Um, if there's specific control wording, um, I would evaluate that um, and then kind of compare to how they tested it and then look at the report to see the conclusions they, uh, that they came to. Um, uh, and a good audit report, and especially like a SOC 2, um, they're going to test the design of the control, um, and they're also going to test the effectiveness. So um, I would first make sure that the 
the control that they have tested and they're referring to uh, was designed correctly, written correctly. Um, and then, like I said, look at the audit report, see if it addresses um, that particular control and looking at both the design and the effectiveness of it. So hopefully that answers your question. No, Justin, I think it does. You know, so you pointed out the design of the control and the operating effectiveness. When I was talking earlier, I shared the example or the difference between an auditor just testing policy and procedures versus one going the extra mile of picking samples, looking at screenshots, doing interviews, right? So those are some key things. Um, one question from Mitchell, uh, he or she asks, what about peer reviews of the audit companies? And this one I can take, right? So as an auditor, as of Align, uh, we subject ourselves to peer audit reviews um, annually. So we have a, a, a separate organization that's registered with the PCAOB um, and, and the AICP as well. They come and review a sample of the reports that we issue from a stock to perspective per year, right? Uh, so that's an example. So we do those peer reviews. From a high trust standpoint, for example, um, we don't issue the report for high trust. We do the testing, we do the audits, we submit the assessment to the high trust um, um, organization within their portal called MyCSF. High trust does an independent review of every single assessment submitted. And that's not just for Align, that's for every high trust certified assessor firm. Uh, they must, uh, high trust must review the work that the auditor, the has the approved assessor firm did, and, and then they issued the a report, right? Uh, if the quality of the work of the auditor was not up to par, HITRUS would kick that report back, and the auditor has to either redo work or the client has to find a separate, a different auditor to redo the work all over again, right? And Jason, you know, from because you guys went through HITRUS, you know, there's a rigorous Q&A process from HITRUS there. And um, uh, not, not to sound very promotional, but Align, uh, as of today, we've been doing actually since 2015, uh, so uh, almost 10 years there. Uh, we've never had a, a report rejected from uh, High Trust, right? All the quality of our testing is always up to par, and all our clients that have gone through High Trust have been certified. And again, that speaks volume, right, in terms of the peer reviewness uh, from, from a separate entity on the work that the auditor does. Let's see here. I think we have maybe time for one or two more questions. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see it really quick. A uh, couple of questions I'm trying to filter through. Sure. The ones that we can answer now. And, and for any question that we will not answer right now, uh, mm -hmm. we'll make sure that we can we have a follow up uh, to send those as well. Uh, so one from uh, Arshad, uh, he or she says, hi, Jason, what are the key things that quarterly compliance reports must have? This is a general question as we are thinking of rolling out some newsletters for all employees and looking for some inputs here. Um, so quarter quarterly compliance reports, um, kind of from an internal, I think you mentioned a, a newsletter. So just... Uh, are you talking about a documentation that says, you know, here's how we're doing and in, in is, for example, our our compliance with high trust requirements. Um, here's some things that we we found. Or are you talking about uh, an actual external auditor coming in and performing some type of quarterly procedure? Just so I believe the individual may be talking about both uh, both internal okay. uh, quarterly compliance assessments, so maybe an internal audit. And then if you're performing, if the organization is performing external audits as well, mm -hmm. how to combine those two to update employees internally on best practice security measures, how are we doing and those sort of things. Gotcha. Well. Yeah. So I think the key there, uh, again, is, um, you know, if it's a security or IT oriented type of um, uh uh, testing or uh, uh, reporting that you're doing, I'd uh, make sure that that is in very non-technical language, uh, very clear and easy to follow, um, pointing out uh, what you're comparing against. So, uh, you know, for an example, if it was a high trust and I was sending us something out to our um, uh, uh, workforce wide, um, you know, I might say, you know, uh, we've been evaluating, you know, uh, these particular high trust requirements uh, internally. Um, and, you know, here's where we're, here's where we're at, you know, we're, we're kind of, uh, maybe even do it in a, uh, 
yeah, color coded, you know, green, like, like we're good, you know, uh, yellow, maybe, you know, we're, we're struggling in some areas with, uh, uh, this particular area of high trust requirements, um, from an external, uh, point of view, if you have someone come in and actually doing quarterly compliance reports, you kind of go back to the same thing as the quality audit reports, um, you know, uh, covers the scope, um, clear, clearly written, uh, concise recommendations, things like that. Absolutely. No, I, I couldn't agree more, Jason. I think recommendations are key. You know, as a security manager or a, a, a VP of security or director of security compliance, whatever role you play in the organization, um, um, if you tell the whole company, you know, we passed an audit with no exception, everybody may, may go good, but we will have expected some uh, recommendations at least, at minimum, right, on things that we can do sure. better. Because when you write that check to the auditor, you, you want to see the value add, right? Um, uh, so like you mentioned, Jason, I think recommendations are always good. At what can we do from an operational standpoint to improve our control environment? What can we do from a security standpoint, privacy standpoint, right? Uh, backups, do we have redundant backups and, and those sort of things are, are recommendations that um, um, operational IT folks are always looking for or security folks are always looking for. For that question, one thing that I would add is uh, one good, you know, uh, a quarterly audit that is good to provide feedback to your organization on is the click rates on phishing emails, right? I think that's always a good one. Employees want to know how are we doing on click rates are, is 30% of the company clicking on phishing emails whenever the IT team sends simulated attacks, right? So I think those are the, some of the good things because the idea of any audit is to build uh, best practices and good habits within your employees, and your control environment overall, right? So employees, one of the way to benchmark that is the click rate on phishing email. So that's a good one to send out there. I think we're at the, at the end of our time today. For everyone that attended, thank you very much for joining our compliance corner for the month of July, where we talked about quality. Again, this is the very first uh, key result of our four-part key results uh, from our 2024 compliance benchmark survey. Next month, we're going to talk about efficiency. Then the month after, we'll talk about culture of security. And then the final month, uh, the, the, the fourth point there would be partnership when it comes to security. So thanks for everyone that attended. I hope you enjoyed the session today. Any questions we'll not get a chance to answer on this particular uh, webinar. We'll make sure that we have follow-ups through emails. Uh, thank you, everyone, and we'll see you next month. Thanks, everyone.